some of your uh, responsibilities when you had taken over Vinya uh, would have included uh, operational procedures, etc. Uh, the this, this sort of thing that's not front and center in an organization of, of your sort or in sort. Uh, uh, how did you, uh, what was the status like? Did, did it require changing? Uh, because, and again, I come back to this uh, father figure that the organization had uh, and and the systems and procedures he had maybe set up. Uh, did you uh, uh, need to overhaul or change certain Oh, yes, certainly. There were, I must say, in certain areas, drastic changes had to happen because this was a movement or an organization built uh, on voluntarism. Mm. And uh, they, they are, there are very deeply committed uh, um, uh, volunteers and full-time workers from village level up. And, uh, but still on the other hand, we are being a large organization and having the largest network, social uh, grassroots network in Sri Lanka, receiving large amounts of uh, support in terms of finances and other resources, uh, we, we had to manage a very complex organization. Then the, uh, the skills you require at different level, managerial skills, then the whole culture, you know, they are all service oriented, but sometimes you have to look at the efficiency because uh, we still um, have to uh, pay bills, you know, electricity to all that. So, you, uh, when we, in the social sector, the philanthropic, uh, you know, mindset sometimes, uh, often uh, ignores the cost, real costs of certain actions. So, I had to uh, make sure that while retaining the spirit of voluntarism and service orientation of the organization, we become an efficient and effective organization. There we had to bring in uh, a mix of professionals from outside who again uh, were very you know, uh, carefully selected uh, to make sure that they uh, identify with the value system of the organization but then give uh, training, sometimes uh, close down certain units which are unproductive uh, and uh, this whole in the business world you have what you call outsourcing. Now for the voluntary sector this is not known. Mm -hmm. You have to have everything inside whether it is a video unit or whether it is you know mm -hmm. whatever. So now that that kind of okay we don't have to have this expertise within the organization. We can get it from outside mm -hmm. on a voluntary basis or, or, or on a paid uh, basis which will be much more cost effective for the organization. So such changes had to be done. Then of course this is quite different to the older generation's um, way of doing Absolutely. things. Yeah, exactly. So, how, how do you deal with uh, such such drastic yes. change? Your father has been heading these organizations. Yeah, I must say that uh, the, the my father as well as the elders of the organization gave me a free hand. I mean, they are, uh, of course, I uh, always put it to the to the uh, executive committee uh, which consists of all the senior uh, uh, members of the organization as well as uh, the, the uh, several management layers and always try to work through consensus uh, without being threatening to anyone's sort of authority or power and uh, I, I think it came naturally I didn't make a uh, extra effort as such but there were times that you uh, could not get certain decisions done but then you persist and somehow I was able to uh, uh, collectively get things done and I also had a, 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 a group of um, uh, professionals who were helping me uh, who also came uh, sometimes from the private sector bringing in new ideas and could also blend very well with the uh, older uh, generation. So, uh, I wouldn't say that I had a, a situation where I, I just could not go through. Today's private sector, uh, th th there's a great uh, need or th there's heavy emphasis on accountability, on performance, on, on measurable results. Yeah. And, and this, I suppose, to a great deal has, has filtered down to uh, the, the voluntary organizations, the charities as well, to a great extent. There, there's a lot of uh, donors want to know how, how effectively their charity dollars are, are being spent. Uh, but you, uh, you know, is there a sort of conflict here in bringing an organization, uh, bringing organizational sort of best practices uh, and, and associated uh, delivery of results uh, with the somewhat accommodative culture that charities have, that software they may have. How do you reconcile it? That's a challenge. Now, uh, some of the village level activities that we do are not readily measurable in economic terms or even uh, uh, they are not even quantifiable. But we believe that they have a very positive impact 
uh, in the village. Now, some of the spiritual uh, activities that we do, now our organization is inspired by Buddhist and Gandhian thinking, but we are a very multi-religious organization. We work in uh, all communities, uh, Tamil, Muslim, uh, Sinhala, Christian, all uh, communities living in Sri Lanka. And we try to bring in the inner uh, uh, values and connections uh, within people. And those things also require certain activities which are, sometimes the donors would say, what is the impact of this activity? You can't measure the unity that is within the village. Now, you have to uh, sometimes develop frameworks, you know, logical frameworks and all that to fit in some of these things. Now, we have given up developing uh, such measurable frameworks for certain activities and we are not even relying on donors to outside donors to fund those activities. So there uh, we just continue because we believe that these are important as individuals for us to be happy and you know be connected to our community to, to, to do our work. On the other hand the other activities where as you correctly said accountability is very high sometimes even I would say worse than the pri private sector because the private sector you are accountable mainly to your shareholders here you have to be accountable directly to your community that you are serving that is our primary accountability uh, partner then the then the, uh, the fi funding partners at the same time you are always exposed now the media to all you know always keeping an eye on you so therefore I had to uh, introduce certain systems and structures which were not existent in the organization before so that you conform to all so okay uh, what are those benchmarks how how do you benchmark a sort of organization like like you have i mean you yourself say that there's one area of which you've completely given up on trying to measure yes uh, but but isn't a benchmark important yes but uh, what i'm saying is even in those areas uh, we have uh, we have a way to measure they are more qualitative what I am saying is we they don't readily fit into existing logical frameworks but that doesn't mean that they are not measurable even even a spiritual transformation in a community is measurable but we are not um, wasting too much time in showing that change in order to attract uh, donor funding that is the difference but we have to benchmark their level of poverty in a village for example is always measured before we, we start any activity. We, we have to show that there has been a change. Yeah. The number of, uh, you know, the children who are malnourished in a village. Mm -hmm. That uh, change has to be measured. So, so uh, those are there. As an organization, as, as Sarvo there, yeah. who are your peers? Yeah. How do you benchmark your performance? How do you know your, 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 your at, uh, optimal performance? In Sri Lanka, the such benchmarks have not been institutionalized in the uh, non-profit sector. I, I ag agree with you. But in other countries, particularly in the West, if you take some international uh, organizations like Oxfam, Save the Children Fund and all that, because they are dependent on public donations. So they have benchmarking for organizational efficiency. We have also introduced uh, uh, such uh, uh, performance indicators within the organization. So those are there. Now, uh, 10, uh, 15 years ago, we didn't have uh, 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 benchmarks for human resource development uh, because it all the, the workers came from the grassroots, started as volunteers and got, you know, th through their performance, got selected to higher positions in the organization. We then introduced uh, another track, two-track system, where you also openly advertise and get people. And then we monitor the turnover rate and you know why they are, and exit interviews. All these part of the corporate culture was also brought in. Okay. So those are now standard practices within the organization. Uh, th that would perhaps help you compare against last year's performance or per performance three, four years ago. What I'm curious about is is how do you know you're running at optimal level compared to, for instance, Save the Children or, or, or UNICEF or such organizations which also look at uh, community uh, uh, community empowerment, not yes. in the same way yes. as you do, but... Yes, it is, it's very difficult to uh, uh, say, uh, c compare because we don't have a gold standard to compare ourselves with. So it is always internally defined standards which are also at times uh, now in the non-profit sector outside the, in, in the other developing countries sometimes they use we compare those that that that's the only right. way but other than that we can't really uh, say that this is the gold standard for any given 
social development or community development activity. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you look at other charities yeah. like, like CARE or UNICEF, yeah. uh, they don't work in this fuzzy empowering communities area. It's, it's impossible to measure. It's, it's, it's fuzzy. No, it can, it can be measured. Now, for example, you saw the, the, in the video uh, how our primary unit uh, at the grassroots level is the village society. Now, we, we more or less work in about 15,000 villages, but not all are at the same level of development. Out of that, 5,000 villages have their own independently registered societies. Now, those societies, if you visit a village like what was profiled here, the empowerment can be seen by the uh, organization that they have, how frequently they, they meet, the membership that they cover and the types of activities that they do, how much they are involved, how ordinary people are involved in their decision making process, how they interact with government agencies in that area, demand things for their village and how some of the unfulfilled uh, needs are sure. being fulfilled. Sure. Those are the benchmarks sure. at village sure. level. Uh, just, just finally, I did, I, I probed this area quite a bit now, but, but are you in, in do you, are you left wondering if you are doing the best you can do with your donor dollars when it you don't have an international peer yeah. or a benchmark? Do do you wonder? Uh, yes, we we do wonder, but at the same time there are bigger challenges. I think benchmarking uh, is now relevant to the other areas, not the areas that probably we have been primarily involved in the last fifty years. For example, community development, fulfilling basic needs in the community. People ask us, now, with the kind of peace activities that you did and all that, were you able to stop the war? I mean, these are honest questions people are asking. So now, we, we can't, uh, you know, answer some of the questions because our main orientation was not that. Although we believed in integrated development, the next phase we have to look at real empowerment in uh, areas like good governance and uh, peace building in the country where you know all communities can live in harmony so they are I think we'll, it's an evolving process there is no end so we have to now start and I, I must say honestly uh, we have self evaluated our, our challenges and then now looking forward to the next phase.